ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ do it again one more time one more time with mr custer he won't he won't leave i actually even got him a car and he says he's not leaving he's still here, here. he says hey i like this uh podcast and stuff i like so, so is the uber guy still sitting out front yeah the uber guy's been out there now for two and a half weeks <laughs> if, if, if he's having fun we're having fun it's all absolutely good. uh the uber, the uber guy they don't have meters so i guess i don't think you pay by the time with uber I don't know how you pay. I no, it's like it's like a, so much. Uh, it's based on the trip. I think the distance. Yeah, I used it in Vegas. It was pretty slick. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I don't think it works on time. Have you yeah, ever you used app an... on your phone and call them up and pay, and then uh, where yeah. do you go? Have you ever used an Uber, Dave? Uber. I have actually. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I even have the app on my little phone here. And I have the app on my little phone too. And it's really a. It's it's really a, a neat thing to be able to take advantage of. I mean, it really works almost anywhere in, in a suburban area anyway. And yeah. it's it's reasonably priced. It's reasonably priced and it's slick. That's the the other thing. And it was really slick in Vegas because, man, you just pretty much anywhere you went, you could, when you knew you're were, you were like three or four minutes out from getting to wherever you were going to meet, you know, getting to the end of like on the old part of Vegas when you walk down uh, whatever that street's called the old, old Vegas and you walk, you know, you're getting there, you just open up the Uber and boom, you almost can time it perfectly. And the car's there. I met a, and then uh, I met a, uh, one really nice young guy and I kind of, he gave me his number so I could just text him directly. It was pretty slick. We need, that's what we need at the old AML. We need some sort of a, you know, something, uh, something similar to whatever Uber is in podcasting. You need an AML app. We need, I actually wouldn't mind an AML app. I don't know what we'd put on it, but I'd really like one. I don't know. We could uh, we could put updates. I guess you could. I don't know what could you, you can do that on Patreon already, though, right? What uh, an app? Yeah, the Patreon app. You can put updates and messages on. Can I? I'm pretty well, sure you can. Then you know more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> if you get on Patreon, there's comments and stuff too. Well, sure, but I don't think there's yeah. any kind of particular app. It... Yeah, I've got a Patreon app on my phone. Well, yeah, I have an app, but I don't think... Yeah, and, we, and, and we, it, allows you, it allows you to get the messages and things like that. Yeah, but I'm talking about an AML app. Oh, okay, specifically AML app. Specifically AML. Try to Which links to the Patreon app. Now, you, you know what? I'm gonna, before we get started, before we get Tony into the studio, I think I need to give you guys an, a heads up. Uh, uh, do you have a leaf blowing day today? No, well, yeah. I, I literally, as I was going, <laughs> I, like, I, I could hear one over... The hill in my, like right outside, if you stood on my front porch, I'm like in a, a you know, kind of like, I don't know what we yeah. call this area. It's the, it's the, it's the end of the Canadian shield. So if you yeah. stand on my front porch, there's houses across the street. And then behind those houses is a, is a hill. Like a, you can't build on this hill. And then on the other side of the hill, you know, it's a steep hill. And on the other side yeah. of the hill is the rest of the subdivision. And I could, as I was going out tonight. The, to dinner, I could hear a guy on the other side of the hill with his leaf. There were, there were, my neighbor, my original guy that I posted about was blowing his leaves again. And then I could hear a guy on the other side of the hill blowing his leaves. And I'd already Facebooked a lot, did a Facebook live with the guy yeah. earlier in the day. And he just kept staring at me. And after I turned it off, he says, what are you doing? I says, oh, I was doing Facebook live. He says, I don't want to be on it. I said, okay, no worries. Don't worry about it. And uh, <laughs> you wouldn't, and I'm thinking you wouldn't have been on if you weren't leaf blowing. So Tony, we have a pro. I have a, I have a. To, let's get Tony into the. Let's get Tony into the studio, and then I can bring him up yeah. to speed. Uh, Mr. Custer, please uh, just take your seat there, and I'll lock the door to the studio. And if uh, Otto shows up, we'll make him. We'll make him knock when he gets here. He can knock and peer through the window. Are you there, Tony? Yes, I'm right here. No, it's a boy. Out of boy. Uh, geez, I don't know if I've ever said attaboy to Tony. <laughs> well, there you go. This may be name a podcast first. <laughs> What's that, Tony? You just get one of those. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fair. <clears throat> that, yeah, that's 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 an honest that's an honest answer. I like it. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's like Dave. I've told you about my friend Harold in uh, in uh, Florida. Mm -hmm. He's a perfect Southern gentleman. 
Uh, tinge of redneck, but basically a perfect Southern gentleman. Was an Air Force guy for years, and then he worked for um, the guys that do the co- make the copier machine in Rochester, right beside Kodak. What were the Xerox? Guys? Xerox, yeah. Yep. You worked yep. for them for years. Anyways, he's uh, seventy-seven, seventy-eight. Harold, I love the I love the guy to death. And uh, if you're a day younger than him, you're boy. If you're a day older than him, you're sir. <laughs> Which is which is why you get one with Tony. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> one and done. <laughs> and my favorite, I'll start. I'll digress here. My favorite Harold story of all time. I've been I've been now in this neighborhood for ten years in Florida. Lots of friends. Uh, uh, there's a particular guy. Early, early, early on in the first uh, three or four months, I was invited to Dave's house to this regular uh, Tuesday night poker game that. He- and he has about 15, 16 people. And Harold and Wanda were uh, one of the two of the folks who would go there. And Dave has a very strict rule about you can't use uh, swear words in his house. And if you do, you got to pay a dollar. And if you use the, the more stronger swear word, you got to pay five dollars. And I didn't know this. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. We're six months into the thing. And one night I just and, and I, you know, I made friends with lots of people. And one night, uh, one fellow I knew I could chirp at. I said something and I used uh, an off color word and Harold comes to me at the break and he goes, boy, we don't cotton to that kind of talk around here. (laughs) And this was before I knew him. Right. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, I'm an adult too. And he's, and I said, well, okay. And I says, son, I'm serious. We just don't cotton to that kind of talk around here. (laughs) I'm like, okay. And Whoa. Was, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, and it was like, okay, I know I understand. Uh, so anyways, that's my story. Harold is, uh, I love Harold. Harold is a uh, just the kind of person you want to hang around with. So anyways, Tony, this is it, buddy. This is part six. I'm not letting you come back again for a while. Oh, thank God. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now move your microphone on an eighth of an inch closer to your mouth. Okay. Is that better? That is perfect. That is perfect. Um, so I have a question, Doug, uh, so we, tonight we got, uh, this is part six and tonight we're going to delve, I think we should delve into more about the nickel plate because I never got Tony, uh, gave Tony a chance to talk about the nickel plate in the previous 10 hours of podcasting we've done. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we also, we have Dave, uncle Dave Abel, he's here. Uh, and we also have Bruce, the moderately agitated mailboy. Yes. Who's always with us. Always, always, always. Uh, anyways, um, so I have a question. I was thinking about it today, and we'll start. We'll start the conversation off with this question, uh, and see if I can word it properly. Bruce, feel free to jump in and straighten me out here. I will do my best. Um, so Tony, I if I understand this correctly, you the Allegheny Midland was very heavily influenced by Alan McClellan. You weren't unhappy with the Allegheny Midland. You enjoyed that experience. But then when you got to, with when you and Bill Darnaby got more and more involved with timetable and train order, you really wanted to change to that mode of operation. And yet, do you notice now, like you take, like really, I was thinking, Dave, we got two guys on the opposite end of the spectrum here, because Dave, you love uh, mainline railroading and CTC and what signals do. I mean, you're all about that. And then Tony's the other op- end of the scale where it's time to him trainer. So, Tony, were you like, when you did the nickel plate, was it like, I remember you saying one of the podcasts was uh, CTC is kind of like Simon says, but was it, was it more because you were just like, I hate paperwork. I always say that if I wanted to model paperwork, I'd just, you know, do a, do a scale model of my business. But is it, was it the interaction with other operators or what exactly was that? key thing between ctc and timetable and train order that made you what was the moment that's what i'm looking for what was the moment when you said that's it i'm done i'm changing well that's a that's a complex question so it's a complex answer but i think i can simplify it a little bit um for starters the allegheny midland had been in that basement for 25 years so it's not like i hadn't had a chance to pretty much exploit it so that's one factor um Secondly, there was the, any improvements to the Allegheny Midland were going to involve a lot of wiring of the CTC machine 
in a lot of software, probably Bruce Chubb's CMRI system, and a lot of signal installation. I had the CTC machine. It's out at the NMRA Museum in San uh, Sacramento, California now. But it never was fully wired or anything like that. Uh, the wiring that makes it work now was done after it got to California by Seth Newman and probably some others. Um, but I know Seth led that effort. So there was a tremendous amount of work ahead. And this was before some of the software shortcuts that you can take today. So there was a huge amount of work to do and a, a considerable expense ahead. Uh, and all I was going to do is make the railroad easier to operate. So what was the point of that? Uh, you know, the cruise, the way it was is, you know, if you were operating a train, you just ran till you ran out of your limits or you under CTC, you ran till you got a red signal. And if you're sitting there for a while, you, you probably got bored and started talking to the other guys. And that was distracting. And the main part of the Allegheny Midland was in two-thirds of the basement that the nickel plate's in. So it was even more compact areas, which bred more conversations among crews. So there were some issues there that needed to be resolved. And uh, more CTC uh, installation wasn't going to solve them. Meanwhile, I had had a chance to go out and operate on the Batavia Club in Illinois and experience timetable and train art operation firsthand. Now, I was familiar with it because I broke in as an operator on the former Neckel Plate. It was by that time in NW. And I was familiar with the book of rules and train orders and stuff because they still operated under those rules in the area that I had broken in. On and almost went to work for them. I applied for the job. They didn't need anybody. So I went to work for a, as a civil engineer. And one week into my civil engineering career, the uh, chief dispatcher called me up and said, we need you. Come to work for us. And I said, well, it's too late. I told my wife what the job was really like. And she said, no, we're not doing that. Because, you know, as the low man on the total pole, I would have been working the extra jobs all over the system and and uh you know with a wife and kids at home that wasn't particularly a, a great idea i don't even know why i thought about it but you know how it is when you get a bee in your bonnet so i was spared a uh horrible uh career move i think <laughs> two uh, things tony i i if you it sounds to me like your mic's a little bit close so lionel can argue about that one later like we argued last time about pictures um because <laughs> yeah. that's what that's what we do sometimes. That's what we do. We argue. That's what we do. Yeah. There's no. There's no. Look. There's no harmony unless there's a little bit of discord, guys. That's how it works. Uh, so Tony, if you can move it just a little, maybe back to that eighth oh, of did. an inch away. There you go. That sounds good. Uh, the other thing I I have a I have a, a synergy story uh, quickly is that I I nearly accepted a job on Norfolk Southern, which of course is the Norfolk and Western. Um, it's, it's where N, N, N W and Southern both ended up was in Norfolk Southern. And similar, they offered me a job when I, they, they didn't need me when I first applied and they came back and they offered me a job when I had already accepted a job at NJ Transit. And so I did not go to Atlanta for the civil engineering program. And I, if I had, I would have taken a slight pay cut, but more importantly, I wouldn't have gotten on uh, a, a list to buy a house in Lebanon, New Jersey. I, <laughs> I never would have gotten on the train to meet my wife. There'd be no Onondaga cutoff, at least not in its current form. And so it's funny how life's twists and turns will take you with that. I think that's a that's an interesting point. But, you know, one of the things I think that's it's interesting about your railroad, it, you know, the current version of the nickel plate, uh, it's I love hearing the roots of it in the Allegheny Midland and the Batavia Club and Bill Darnaby, who's fabulous. That was that was a highlight of my model railroading career so far was to operate at Bill Darnaby's during the Chicago RPM last year. And um, you know, take take my uh, take my my rookie burnishings, I guess, or my rookie corrections, uh, rookie rookie flame throwing, <laughs> as it were, with some of the idle mistakes that we make as we learn uh, timetable train order. And you know, having operated on both of your railroads, I, f I feel there's a lot of similarities. So I definitely see the influence there. And 
one of the things I was curious about is, you know, as far as CTC goes, because again, you talked extensively about how that would be applied to the Allegheny Midland if you were going to make that next step with it. So, you know, part of the, the whole idea for your next step in model railroading was to go back to childhood roots, but also go back to timetable train order and use lessons from both layouts. So it wasn't one, or, it wasn't one thing. It was a, a couple different watershed moments that came together to, 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 to guide you to your next step. Yes, it was. I don't think timetable and train order would have worked on the Allegheny Midland. It was too, the distances between towns were too close. That was a railroad that really needed to be double-decked. But if it had been double-decked, I think a lot of the scenic vistas would have been ruined. So it was a railroad made for CTC, very much like the V&O was. So I think I, I made all the right decisions on the Allegheny Midland. And that was why it needed to come down if I was going to do timetable and drain order. And uh, I think by yeah. by that time, I had enough experience on Bill Darnaby's to know that it was, a, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was almost fun to the point of being scary at times. Yeah. But, no, uh, you know. Sorry, go ahead. Jump in. Okay, I, I was thinking uh, Steve King was part of your Appalachian lines and his uh, uh, Virgi Virginia Midland, right, was his? Yes. No, he, he ran timetable and train order, did he not? Do you have any experience with him on that or any? Oh, yes. You uh, must, you must. I'm sure you know, he, he, he's a, a well-known expert on, on the on the art of timetable and train order. I'm, uh, he wrote the book. Few, uh, he wrote the book. He and, wrote the uh, book. He did, too. It's a great book. <laughs> it is well, a great we, book. We had Steve come up here to Newton and teach a class in timetable and train order before we got too heavily involved in my basement. And... uh Steve has got a way of presenting things in a in a really mellow way. Uh, he's a, just a wonderful teacher, and uh, he's uh, if he catches you doing something wrong, unlike Bill Darby or Jack Hosanich, you don't get nailed to the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yes, Steve will ask you. Well, he, for example, he caught me one time at who knows Model Railroad, where. Uh, my train was coming down the hill, and uh, I walked way ahead of it and threw a switch to get into the yard. And Steve was standing there, and he says, who threw that switch? And I looked at him like, you know, what, is it, what are you, stupid or something? You just saw me throw it. And then I suddenly, you know, instantly, Steve doesn't ask stupid questions. And uh, it suddenly dawned on me that there was absolutely nobody within a, a scale mile of that switch to throw it. Um, and stupid me had walked ahead of the train and thrown the switch out of sheer convenience. And uh, Steve had just, you know, very politely, with a big grin on his face, said, hey, who threw the switch, you know? And he taught timetable and train order operation the same way. We had him at a local restaurant, and we got the back room uh, where they had banquets and stuff. We got that for either the I think it was the whole day, and then... Uh, the next day, we came over the, to the nickel plate and then operated. I don't know whether we had 30 people or whatever it was, but um, you, you kind of need to do that um, to get people immersed in it. If you don't have a local railroad that has timetable and train our operation now, that today we don't need to do that because they can uh, come one or two at a time on the extra board of the nickel plate and start picking it up. I had a a new guy that lives just over the first ridge of the what we jokingly call mountains here in northwest New Jersey, uh, come yesterday at the last minute when I was short a crew, and uh, uh, I'll have him back. He did a he did a good job, and he's a young guy, you know, probably in his thirties, maybe forties, but I think thirties, and uh, so he will now be a disciple that'll start taking the word around to model railroad clubs and other layouts. And, and so once you get a foothold uh, with timetable and turn operation or CTC, I mean, CTC's got its own little complexities. Um, you know, what, what does, uh, you know, red over yellow mean? You know, what can you do with that? And uh, what's a call on mean? So um, that, I to get back to Lionel's original question, uh, I think the Allegheny Midland was essentially what I've called fully amortized. There was a huge investment probably in the neighborhood of $4,000 ahead of me in terms of software and signaling. 
that was simply going to make it easy, even easier for crews to um, run their trains without making any decisions at all on their part. And meanwhile, I'd learned from Batavia and, and then from Darnaby the timetable and train order gave the crews most of the responsibility for decision making. And, and uh, if you'd have seen the railroad before yesterday's operating session, you just found uh, five trains stuck in the hole uh, for superior trains. And the dispatcher did not tell them to get out of the way of superior trains. Those engineers um, had to look at the timetable. Um, all but one of them were westbounds, which are inferior by direction. And those engineers had to look at the timetable and say, you know, there's an eastbound that is due right here where I am, and I can't move from this spot. I better get off the main line before he shows up and uh, wait right here until he shows up, no matter how long it takes, up to 12 hours. After 12 hours, I can go. Not 12 hours from this minute, but 12 hours from his scheduled time of arrival. And the dispatcher had nothing to do with that. All, the, all those decisions were made on the part of the crew. Now, the dispatcher, knowing that guy is stuck there, could have written him a helping order, a 19 order, saying um, the superior train is running X hours late or uh, the westbound has right over the eastbound or something like that. But that, <laughs> that depends on that particular station being open. And some stations aren't DN stations, day-night stations. So there's all, all these little if and but kind of things that make it uh, kind of interesting. And, and uh, it's like, I don't know whether it's like bridge or it's like chess or something, but it's, it's, it's an intricate little game to learn. And once you learn it, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I thought that it would be worth building a railroad that it tested all those things. So I made a design for it. But I did a single deck design, and Bill Darnaby got wind, wind of that, and he said, "I think you're making a huge mistake." He says, "You're making one lap around the basement and going into staging about halfway over the division, and you're you're going to have your crews walking out about halfway through the movie." And uh, I said, "Well, I, I'd have to have a second deck to." Uh, let them see the second half of the movie and get the other division points so they could run from terminal to terminal. And he says, that's why I have a second deck. He says, there's some things you just got to do if you're going to run timetable and turn order operation on a relatively high-speed railroad. Now, just down the street from me is Perry Squire, and he has a single deck timetable and train order operation, but it's a 12-mile-an-hour uh, railroad, a short-line railroad. That was a bunch of short lines that were pieced together into a, a bigger railroad, but it was bankrupt almost its entire existence. And uh, they kind of made do and never did get up to speed. And, and uh, so he compensates for shortness of mainline run on single deck with, uh, to some extent, with the single deck. I think he'd have been much better off with a double deck railroad too, but uh, he didn't want a double deck railroad. But Darnaby convinced me to have one, so I did. So I don't know whether that answers your question or not, Lionel. Do you, do you remember, uh, like, telling Alan McClellan about it? Like, do you remember what his reaction was? I don't know that I ever said, hey, Alan, guess what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I, I certainly don't remember Alan ever reacting to it one way or another. Um, surely we had that conversation. Um but I think it would it was that that sounds to me like a pretty awkward conversation. So I, <laughs> I can see me I can see me ducking that one. <laughs> you know? You're doing what? Yes. <laughs> but that whole that whole double deck layout concept I think is 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 yet another thing that if if not pioneered was certainly made popular, Tony, by your writings um you know through the years and and, and encouraging that. And it's something I've heard from you know from Jim Dalberg from Bill Darnaby when I, when I, when I've solicited his advice, uh, yourself, Jerry Diedzik, a, a bunch of people that have a lot of experience operating Steve King, actually, the first time I met him was at Jerry Diedzik years ago. Uh, <laughs> I, he, he, let, he wanted me to be the conductor so he could be the engineer on a job. So I, 
talk about, and this is my first time ever, or second time ever operating timetable train order. And Steve King is your engineer. Perfect. Oh, boy. I, I got a lot of those smiley questions, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think, boss? You think, um, are you sure that's a good idea? <laughs> yeah. Do you think you we sure should, call you... the, should we call the flagman in now or leave him out a little sure bit Are you sure that you can yeah. actually meet at Sparta Junction? Uh, well, it's a junction. Uh, are you sure you can meet at Sparta Junction? Let me look at the timetable. <laughs> nope. So, you know, so on and so forth. But that double deck layout concept, I think, is, is a critical one. Because it's been absorbed not just by timetable train order people, where you know the distance between endpoints on a timetable train order railroad is absolutely critical for there to be any flow at all, because the the, the decision making is with the crews, like Tony said. So if you're going to run from town A to town B, you better make sure that all the trains that were supposed to be past you are already past you, and that. Anything that's superior to you, and especially if you're in the inferior direction, because that's that's part of the timetable, is is not going to be against you on that same time or within, I think, 10 minutes of, of your arrival at that station. So you can quickly get into the situation Tony described, where it's, you know, yesterday at this, at this session, Tom Schmieder, who's a buddy of mine, was the dispatcher. And he, he, he called me and told me I was, I was supposed to be at the session if the kids hadn't gotten sick at the wrong time. Um, but that said, yeah, he said it went really well and talked to me a little bit about how things went because it, it's such a great adaptation of timetable train order. But when you go to the, the double deck layout concept necessary in Tony's case and in Bill Darnaby's case for timetable train order, that double deck concept really does help out a lot of us CTC modelers as well because the architecture, the, the general atmosphere of, of seeing trains on multiple levels and being focused on just one doesn't sound plausible until you see it in action until you until you read about it from a, a source that's that's done it themselves and tony did it alan did it so it really set the stage for a lot of the rest of us to follow in those footsteps so how uh how many years has the nickel your your version of the nickel plate existed well the allegheny midland came down either december of 99 or december of 2000 we've never been able to quite remember but right at the turn of the century and the plans for the nickel plate that uh, I actually built were drawn by Frank Hodina, who is a uh, resin car shops. Uh, the, any of you who have bought a resin car kit from Sunshine Models, Frank probably did the masters. And if you buy a resin car kit today from resin car shops, that's Frank Hodina. But he's a, he, he has a degree in railroad engineering from the University of Illinois. And uh, Frank... Uh, has got a real good head on his shoulders. He's really good at linear track planning. And he, when he saw the plan that I came up with, he said, let me take a shot at it. And uh, his first plan, all I had to do is tweak it. I mean, change some angles and some yard throats and things like that. I mean, really minor changes. So, uh, you know, that's that's where that came from. One, I want to make one uh, point about the Moldy deck book I did for Kalmbach. And the timing of it, uh, I was up in Canada for, I don't know whether it was an OVAR meeting or uh, what it was, but I did went on a layout tour, and I was amazed at how many multi-deck model railroads there were. It seemed like every one that I saw was either being converted to multi-deck or was already multi-deck. And I don't mean double-deck, I mean multi-deck. There were some triple and quadruple, et cetera, uh, decks. and, and uh, I've always considered Canadians conservative. Uh, you know, they were late with steam, uh, late with kerosene lanterns, you know, the classic passenger car trains. They still run fluted side bud cars and domes and stuff. And uh, they're just a little more cautious to throw away good stuff than we are. And uh, I kind of figured that if the Canadians, with this cautious approach to things, were jumping on that bandwagon, that it was high time that we really examined multi-deck model railroads in depth. And I th I think that prompted the book as much as anything else. So Lionel and his compatriots north of the border uh, probably deserve a pat on the back for that book coming out when it did. Um, you could almost consider it overhanging the market if you looked at the U.S. Um, interest in multi-deck model railroads would 
when the book was published, it flew off the shelves. It was one of the best sellers, just right out of the right off the uh, publication date. It was, uh, I think, sold half the publishing run in two months or something. And that was back when they printed ten thousand copies right off the bat. So, kind of an interesting uh, perspective on that book. Yeah, and that, that's an interesting comment, Tony, because I think up until that point, uh, certainly in the model railroad press, there wasn't a lot of double decker. One that sort of comes to mind is Jim Hediger's Ohio Southern, that he was uh, kind of a pioneer of uh, getting the double deck concept out and uh, uh, promoting that through uh, his writings on his layout. And I always remember his aha moment about looking at the uh, picnic table and flinging the rest of the furniture into storage so he could rebuild his layout double deck. There were two guys that pioneered it. It was Jim Hediger because uh, John Armstrong broached the idea, and he and uh, Lynn Westcott and Hediger had dinner together, and and, uh, Lynn told Jim, he says, well, why don't you build one of these things? And Jim did. But Jim Providenza, out on the West Coast with his Sacramento Northern, I think it's called. No, that's not it either. Jim's going to shoot me for not getting the name right. But uh, at any rate, Jim on the West Coast independently uh, built a multi-deck model railroad at almost exactly the same time uh, without being aware of anything that Hediger was doing. But he was aware of what John Armstrong had written. He thought, well, if John's saying that uh, it's a good idea, it must be a good idea because John Armstrong said so. And also then Jack Burgess with the Yosemite Valley, Jack's a civil engineer. And uh, he just couldn't figure out any way in his garage to get enough of the Yosemite Valley main line on a single deck. So just using pure engineering logic, he said, I'm going to have to have two decks and a, and a helix, a one-turn helix to get up to the second deck. So those are the three guys that pioneered multi-deck model railroads, and they all did it independently. And they all did it at just about the same time. Yeah, uh, Jim's layout is the Santa Cruz Northern. Santa Cruz Northern. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, do you remember who you told first that you were? What did your wife say when you told her you were taking the layout out? Uh, Judy uh, is a critic of uh, what I do when I finish it, but uh, she doesn't care what I'm gonna do. <laughs> uh, she uh, she must have had some interesting thoughts when she saw this great big dumpster in the driveway. And I can't tell you how fast that dumpster filled up. We discovered very quickly that we needed to be extremely neat and tidy about filling that dumpster or it wasn't going to uh, be adequate. Um, Perry Squire, Stan White, and I were the three that took the uh, Midland Road down. And what a disaster. I mean. We were all set to save rail and spikes and some scenes and all that stuff from it. But uh, when when I looked at the railroad and tried to find, you know, a three-foot or a four-foot or a five-foot piece of it that looked good by itself, th- there just wasn't anything in that context. It took like 10 feet of it or 20 feet of it to even begin to represent the railroad. About the only piece of it that got saved was the base of the coal dock area at the Sunrise Engine Terminal. So that, you know, and saving rail and stuff like that, forget that. So the big old Sawzall came out and zap whack. And we did manage to save some uh, one by four lumber that was really good one by four lumber before the crap that's out there today. And that's been built into the nickel plate, although most of the one before lumber is actually three-quarter plywood uh, cut into one before. But, uh, uh, you know, when you tear down the railroad, it's going to be mostly junk. I was uh, I was one of the last people to ever operate a—I actually got to operate a couple of my own locomotives on Alan McClellan's Virginia and Ohio. And then uh, he, you know, because he was just about to take it down and move and all, or, or, and all that stuff. And I said— uh, Man, I said I should. I should have wish I'd shown up a little later. I'd love to have like a hunk of the scenery from the original V and O, and take it and incorporate it into my layout. And he says, 
well, let's take a piece out now. And we took out a hunk of like about a foot square of scenery. <laughs> <laughs> and I just found a place and built it right into my own scenery. And I thought that was uh, so cool. Take that's Oh, that's awesome. It really was. It <laughs> that really, is awesome. Really I love that. I, see, and that's one of the things I love about this hobby is the continuity. You know, and early on, you know, Lionel, you touched up on this conversation. You talked about, you know, CTC versus timetable train order. And, yeah, I, I don't see it as a, as a this or that, per se, as much as I see it as part of the continuity of model railroading, because I think we're all doing this for the same reasons. I, I think that from the most hardcore timetable train order person to the most hardcore CTC person, it's all about a prototype operation and building that spirit of core, the, the camaraderie that it takes to operate a railroad, whether it's, you know, G scale or ho scale or frankly one-to-one whether it's the real the real prototype the idea of coming together to make something happen is something when you go to tony's and you run an operating session you get that you get that feeling like it's it's a bunch of people working together on a railroad that's built for that operating system and you get that at jerry deedzix as well very nicely uh, ted pamperins harry squires i think we get that on the onondaga cutoff on the on the opposite end of the operation spectrum where it's CTC and not timetable train order, but the idea of people coming together at role playing that event within the set of rules and, and, and physical plant that's provided. That's, that's, that's operations. That's the exciting part of the hobby and the growth part of the hobby. I think is that idea of sort of coming together with it. And I love to hear when, when layout owners like yourself, Lionel will take a piece or a car or a component of someone else's layout that they look up to and make it part of their their railroad. And Tony and I have traded some emails about that. Uh, if he ever comes across another Allegheny Midland SD40-2 from Intermountain or what have you, I, I, I'm, I'm first on his list, he says. Uh, and I did end up with one of those, thanks to Jordan Kramer of uh, AML fame. Jordan provided me with a w- one of the Intermountain models that was provided to Alan McClellan that ran on the V&O when, when they did their run of those SD40-2s. And I sent a picture to uh, to Tony, and Tony got a smile out of it, I think. And he said, "You should send one of these to Alan." So I, sure enough, I did. And I and um, it's that continuity. I think that that coming together is an important part of the hobby. So I didn't I didn't realize that you got in a piece of the scenery. Oh, That's yeah. awesome. Uh, <laughs> That's great. Like... That's great. I know, and it was all because I insisted that I take donuts. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> again, it goes back to the fact that Alan is such a gentleman, such a gentleman. It's just, uh, I feel like it was like one of the, one of the, like, if somebody says to me, what's your favorite, you know, people will say, what's your favorite Rara? And, you know, nickel plate, Conrail, whatever they're, or they're, about 10 years ago, I decided my favorite railroad, period, end of sentence, is the Virginian and Ohio. I think, I think that railroad had more influence on me than anything else, you know, and, and of course that was brought to us by Tony, which are, you know. It's like I told, I've told the story before. I can literally remember sitting in my basement when I started my, uh, you know, Allegheny, uh, my ANLS. I can remember sitting in there going with the paint schemes. I think I said it before, but well, I can't be blue and white because that's um, that's a and o and I can't be red and yellow because that's the Allegheny. And I'm thinking, how egotistical could you, could you possibly be? Because I can remember thinking, if I ever do make it to the cover of Model Railroader, and it's like, how egotistical could you be to even have that thought? But anyways, little did I know. So, who do you remember? Do you remember who the first person was that you told Tony that you were taking the layout out? Any? Do you have any recollection? Because I find that, I mean, there's lots of people that have built uh, uh, railroads. You know that. Uh, what's the, what's the phrase I'm looking for, Bruce or or Dave? You know, like uh, lots of people have built model railroads that have have had an impact on the hobby iconic iconic iconic, iconic railroads yes but uh, i can't think of anybody else that's ever built two and well I mean, Al- Al- alan built two different versions right yeah but not two different railroads i mean he uh, you know there's the allegheny midland which is looked upon as okay that was that and then there's well, the, the nickel plate then doug there's... tags old would be one that comes to mind yeah he's it's he, true. He's, he's done yeah, a couple yeah. Like four, um, <laughs> four or five <laughs> yeah. yep yep absolutely and he's got five to go <laughs> <laughs> and bernie bernie kapinski yeah is not, he's very prolific he's always he's always on to his next latest uh adventure lance mendheim yep lance for yep. sure good call 
<laughs> All right. So there's a handful. Yeah, I, I'm just a piker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I yep. was I was wondering how many articles I wrote, and then I had to look. Uh, I was trying to track down an article about Jim Payne's Durham and Southern today uh, for a guy, a, a Canadian uh, college student, was asking me about the Durham and Southern that connected with Allen's Railroad. And so I was trying to track it down through the NMRA's online magazine index. And uh, so it was favoring Jim over Payne, and, and it tripped it, Put up Jim Hediger, and boy, you want to see a list of articles. <laughs> you know, wow, All right, no, prolific. No, there's something I didn't know. The NMRA has a, a magazine index, Bruce. Yep. Yeah, yeah. it's a crowdsourced yeah, one. They they kind of got started back when the original uh, the rumbling where that uh, comeback was going to cast theirs off and no longer support it. Uh, so there's a crowdsource effort uh, from, I think, predominantly NMRA members. I'm not sure if the NMRA funded it. They must have provided some funding. But they, they have, it's a fairly useful one. It's one I use quite often. Uh, I used to use it in conjunction with the, the old model robot until they, they killed that off with their uh, redesign. But it's, uh, it's a fairly useful tool. And uh, you can get in there and uh, yeah, if you go uh, NMRA magazine uh, index, it will take you to the site. And uh, it's fairly user friendly. There it is. I see it. I found it. Look yep. at that. Cool. Uh, that's a question, Tony. And I'm thinking the Durham Southern would have been the late, uh, the late seventies, somewhere in there. It was uh, in yeah. Model Rotor, I believe. Yeah, I, the, I the like part of the Lichen Belt. It. The problem is there was a real Durham and Southern, and then there was Jim Payne's Durham and Southern that had no relationship to it. Yeah. And uh, I, I just struck out. I couldn't find the article. I know we covered it in RMC, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it. Um, well, here's a question for you. I'm sure I, I'm sure I, you know, I, I already know the answer in some form or another, but I mean, how this is Dave, help me with this one. Bruce, help me with this one. Cause it's not going to come out right. I can tell you it's not going to come out. Um, how much interaction do you have with readers? I mean, you said there now somebody contacted you like, like, do you like people contacting you? Not like, that's the wrong word. Are you, are you, are you happy to have people contact? That's not the right word either. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do I, I know what you're saying, Lionel. Yeah. Do you um, appreciate, do you appreciate the back and forth of readers or does it become too much? Does, is, is it an overload? Well, I suppose it could be. Uh, I have so far been able to answer every single email that I get if it's a written com uh, communication, that is difficult to deal with because that means a a piece of paper, an envelope, a stamp, a whole bunch of effort, and uh, that takes a lot more time than just a quick email. Thanks for your note. Uh, but usually, I can. I, I don't remember not ever answering an email from a reader. Uh, some of them. I mean, I'm I'm pretty easy to find. I mean, I used to be a director of the NMRA, so my email was listed on the NMRA, although it might have had an alias like uh, at large director worldwide dot NMRA dot org or something. But it was up there for a while. Uh, you can always get me through uh, Combach; they'll forward it to me, um, and I I think they do that rigorously. Um, I get, oh, 50 to 70 emails a day, and uh, 50 that includes junk, you 50. know, things I can delete pretty quick. And sometimes I'm just un unbelievably busy because I not only have to do model railroad planning, but that's seasonal, uh, and I have to do a book which takes about three months in the first three months of the year, and then MRP is the second three months. And then during the fall, which is now, uh, we proof it. Uh, but I also have to produce a quarterly magazine for the Nickel Plate Society, which is full color, and that means write or edit the articles, do all the Photoshopping, and I do all the Photoshopping on the stuff I send to Kalmbach. And... Uh, my contract with Kalmbach used to require that I write three articles. Well, actually, four articles for them every year, and I I changed the contract to save them some money. So now 
if I write an article, they pay me for it just like they pay you for an article. But uh, so that took some of the workload off of me. But uh, if you happen to write to me during that time, you may get a very short email. But uh, when I'm producing MRP, uh, you know, I may have a brand new author that's never worked with me before and uh, needs a lot of coaching, needs, a, needs some hand-holding. You know, they may not understand that it's really pretty easy to produce an article. It's just really a long email. Uh, it was like when working with Dave on his book, you know, it's it's a pain in the butt in some ways, but it's really not as difficult as, as you might think going into it. And uh, the regular authors, most of them by this time, know the uh, the formula, but uh, it still requires editing and formatting. So when you're in that mode, uh, it's a little difficult to deal with just somebody sending you an email. But uh, I got, for example, one of my extra board guys came to the operating session yesterday, and when he got home, he had a lot of questions about the realistic way bills we use, and he had some questions about wiring and some things like that. And, you know, here this guy drove from Connecticut. It was three, in the, three hours and 19 minutes, according to the computer, each way. And, uh, you know, if somebody's willing to make an effort like that at the last minute to fill a suddenly open slot due to a cancellation, uh, I certainly should be able to find time to answer the guy's questions. So I, I think that way about readers. If somebody's willing to read my magazine, my magazine in quotes, uh, I certainly should be able to find some time to at least acknowledge his email. You're a true ambassador to the isn't he isn't he Dave and oh, there's just it's it sets an example. And this this is you know, this is you know, Tony and I have talked a little bit about this over the last couple of years as as he's really mentored me and guided me um in in the writing style and you know, learning some of some of the stuff that he's talking about, learning how to write a book. I mean, I, I never envisioned myself writing a book. That wasn't, that wasn't something that I'd really crossed my mind uh, at this point in my career or life. And it was Tony that shepherded a good chunk of the writing of that book, um, you know, t- to make to make sure that the first effort, the first try was going to be, was going to be worth our while. Uh, and then a lot of credit goes to Lionel for pushing it. <laughs> uh, I had, I had a lot of, a lot of, a lot of help with that. And, you know, both of you guys opened my eyes with that because it just it reinforces my existing belief about operating sessions that it's it's the it's the team that makes the whole thing work. It's this is not an individual effort. It's it's not a lone wolf hobby. So many of us approach the modeling itself or the layout building as a lone wolf effort. But you know, both of you guys had a real important push in getting my first little book off the ground here and I'm really proud of it. I mean, even in hindsight, there's not a whole lot I would change for 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 what we did, and and it, a lot of that is Tony's skill. Uh, you know, Tony, you, you talk about Steve King and his gentle way of of guiding things along. I remember the first time I wrote for you ever. The first time I wrote for the Model Railroad Press was for Model Railroad Planning 2018, and Tony gently but firmly <laughs> that that you know that that famous that famous phrase gently but firmly. Uh, rebuilt a, a lot of what I put into that first article. There's a lot of red ink, the first couple back and forths. And it was frustrating for me because I, you know, I thought I was, I thought I could handle it. And I obviously had a lot to learn, but Tony's patient and persistent and firm guidance was, look, you know, you, you have to see this from other people's eyes and there's a script and there's a reason there's a script, you know, here, think about it this way. And here's how I would build this. We finally got to a good draft, and and I'll never. I, I still have the email saved. Uh, it's you know, Tony says, Dave, this is a solid draft, good writing. This is the point from which we should use this draft for everything going forward. And that was the point at which I realized, okay, I'd finally gotten to a point now where this was going to be something that, that that could be considered for for MRP. But you know, Tony, in a grand sense, I think really has been an incredible ambassador for the hobby. Uh, not just as an editor of these magazines, but also as someone approachable and someone that a young guy like me, I mean, 44 years young, as it were, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm young, but everybody else tells me I'm young, so I must be young. <laughs> but I can talk to Tony about this stuff and he'll give me feedback. You know, I can talk to Lionel about this stuff. 
they'll give me feedback. And you guys, like your generation really paved the way for a lot of younger guys to get into this stuff. And I think, I think Bruce will agree. Like there's, you know, the fact that we can, the social media has allowed us, email has allowed us to talk directly to the creators of your generation is what's creating the next generation of creators so that we're going to keep this whole thing going. And I, I find that to be very exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be along for the ride. Yeah. And I think that those are good points, uh, Dave. And certainly, uh, the fact that uh, guys like Tony, Lance Minheim, uh, the others, what you might call the big names, are very willing to take time out and and help the others because uh, you know uh, you know they they are in a sense mentors in this hobby. They have a whole pile and uh, vast experience of model railroading to pass on, and uh, you know they uh, I would say they enjoy passing it on just to. Uh, help others out and get some, uh, you know, that, you know, somebody is needs some information and we can pass it on. I, uh, I think that's a really important thing is it seems like the hobby or people that have been successful authors seem like they, they get enjoyment. Most seem to get enjoyment out of perpetuating to get more people to be authors, to get more people to be, I think that's why this podcast has been so successful is, is it, everybody that comes on wants to help the next guy. That's something about model railroading that maybe, you know, I I said once, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I remember listening to it when I was walking around the neighborhood in my, in Florida, when I could go to the, don't, don't get me started on that subject. Well, we didn't. (laughs) I did. (laughs) Well, that's because I remember thinking about it. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember listening because I said, you know, I think in general, model railroaders are pretty intelligent people. It's a, uh, it's an outlet for intelligent people to, uh, it's an outlet for intelligent people. Uh, and I and, think and a diverse group, a diverse group of intelligent people. You know, yeah. I, I think, I think that that's, you know, and, and when you look at the ambassadors, right. So pe- people that, that make the hobby better for everyone, ambassadors like, like Alan McClellan, like Tony Custer, you know, guys like, you know, and then there's the mentorship part. So mentorship to me is different than being an ambassador where you're mentoring on a one-on-one or a small group basis, a collective group of people that are interested in a certain aspect of the hobby, timetable train order. You know, Tony, Jerry Deedzik have have really played a major role in my world for operations because I didn't even know what timetable train order was. I mean, I, I didn't grow up in an era when that was anywhere but on the Gladstone branch of NJ Transit, and that was cool, but I wasn't going to model it. So I didn't really understand how it worked until like I got into model railroad operations. Tony and Jerry have really extended and, and, and other people in the community too, you know, the Ted Pamperins, you know, and, and people that don't have a layout. So, you know, Jim Schweitzer, um, Jim Dalberg, who who does have a layout down in, in Pennsylvania, but there's a, there's a large group of people, Tom Schmieder up here in Long Valley that have, that have, that are always there to say, Hey, I don't under, I'm a first class train. Why did I have to put a flagman behind me? Like I'm a first class train. I own that time. No one can touch me. Well, because the rule says you have to have a flagman behind you. So even the 20th Century Limited, when it was the timetable train order territory or ABS territory, was having a flagman. That that's just how. And it's like I never understood why that happened. So that one on one mentorship, I think, carries a lot of energy as well. And Tony is someone that's been able to do both. You know, not only an ambassador for the hobby but also a mentor for a lot of people that are, that are excited to learn and get more involved, you um, know, and, and, and be big, be a part of bigger things. Uh, I think a really good question, but you guys can determine that. And there, I found this, uh, uh, NMRA, uh, in, in index. I got 84, yes. I got 84 entries in this thing. Holy mackerel. I, I should, I should get the, all this, all your articles I compiled for you these, one of these days. Yeah, you should do that. <laughs> and speaking of articles, uh, Mr. Custer, uh, Durham and Southern, uh, uh, April, 1968 model rotor. I have a PDF here. I can send to you after if you want. Um, there you go. See that? It, uh, Bruce is very good at, at, at finding stuff. April 68. Okay. I'm looking for an RMC in the seventies. Oh, RMC in the same. Okay. This was MR in the 60. Okay. Uh, Tony, I have a question for you. I think it's a good question. It's a tough question. It's a hard question. We don't pull any punches here at the old AML. Um, uh, after all this time of talking to you, I don't think we've really, I don't, I haven't asked you this question directly. 
but what do you feel like has been your biggest contribution to the hobby? Like, what is the thing that, that when you think about it, gives you the most satisfaction? Um, well, I think, I, I guess the body of work that uh, RMC for 12 years and model railroad planning for since 95, the inaugural issue up to now, uh, I'm not going to try to do the math, 21 plus 15, um, or plus 5, I guess it is. Okay. Uh, the uh, See, I, that's why I don't do the math. Right. Anyway, I, think, I, think it's uh, 70, I think it's 78, it adds up. <laughs> so... The uh, like, I, like, know, like I mean, come on, I, I uh, uh, Dave, you failed me there on the last episode when I said to you, "What I want to hear what a ten-year-old Dave would have said to Tony if he could talk." So I'm going to do it because I'm going to tell you what a thirty-year-old uh, Lionel String would have said to you, or in 1984, if he'd known that thirty years later, thirty plus years later, he would get to have this conversation. I can remember sitting in, in my workshop i just i had only just finished this house i was i built a beautiful basement and stuck a house on top of it you know put in steel beams where the train room was going to go i had a 20 by 30 foot empty space that was custom built for model railroad and i can remember sitting there looking at all the article at the articles of the allegheny midland thinking i have got to try to understand i want to reproduce this that's what it was i didn't have any real clear thoughts other than you inspired me as much as anybody has in the in the hobby like sure uh at the end of the day if i had to if i had to pick one or, or, or over the other i'd say sure the virginian and ohio is my absolute favorite railroad of all time followed very closely by the allegheny Mythen. but i mean you your 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 articles and your photos and everything inspired me like it got me to this point of why i have this podcast this podcast would not exist had you not put in as much effort as you did writing those articles and and put in as much effort as you did uh uh with alan mcclellan and and the vno story like you literally are responsible one of the people that are is very much responsible for my entire career in the last 30 years of model railroading. And uh, I'm just like, do you have any sense of, like if I'm speaking for everybody on the planet, I'm, I'm sure that I'm speaking for tens of thousands of people, maybe more than that. It's got to be minimum tens of thousands of people. And I and I make no bones about it. Like over the years, we as we got to know, I didn't agree with you all the time. I and I and I voiced my opinion that I didn't agree with you all the time. But at, now, at at where I sit at this moment in my life, walking away, if it hadn't been for your efforts and your diligence to want to do as good a job as you did, this podcast wouldn't exist. I probably would have never made it to Model Railroader. I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to have a have the column in model railroader. It was because of you that I thought I can do that. I can do that. I got to come up with an idea. I got to talk these guys into letting me have a column. And I bet you there's all kinds of people like me that uh, would love to be able to say to you directly. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for everything you did because man, it sure had a massive influence on my life. Well, and I can say that for my generation too, Lionel. I mean, heartfelt 100%. If it, if it wasn't for Tony taking, taking a chance, you know, Jerry referred some emails that I'd written to him back to Tony and it was Tony, you know, as the keeper of MRP, the editor of MRP that took the chance on my first ever model railroad writing, which is a, a you know bucket list lifetime goal of mine. And then not only did it, but coached me through it. And then, and then suggested after just that piece. And then a few other follow-up articles suggested to Kalmbach that I should be the one to write a single book that I never would have thought myself <laughs> to write. So I mean, Tony, literally, it, it's, it, I, I don't, it's hard to even know what to say. Exactly. But in, in my own defense, though, I have to say, you know, you said 10 year old Dave, and then you said 30 year old Lionel. Well, oh, well, that's, that must be nice. <laughs> what to be 20? Let's years look old? at, let's look at 300% more experience and then see what Dave has to offer. You know, <laughs> come on, Lionel. Ooh, yes. uh, wow. Jeez, Jesus. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, only thing, the only thing you would help that now is if Otto Vondrak showed up and I could ma- I make could ma- uh, give him a hard time for being late. <laughs> there you go. I see you know. And, and, and while while you're doing that, Tony, December 1970 RMC. Summer. December 1970 RMC, supposedly is the uh, issue with the Durham and Southern in it. December 1970. Yeah, I, I sense he's making. Well, you a made note. a you made a young fellow in Canada very happy. Does he have a hockey stick? <laughs> he shoots. He, he shoots. He scores. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, so now, Tony, now you know what to do. Every, next time you need to find an article, just email Bruce, and he'll be right on it for you. He's retired. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I, I, I'll have him on my uh, yeah. official secretary list. There you, there you go. go. That's what I would do. Well, wow. now are you guys out of nickel plate questions before you? No, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got one for you. Okay. Uh, at some point in the thought process between uh, you're deciding the old uh, Allegheny Midland uh, wasn't cutting it for, and you wanted to get into the uh, the nickel plate timetable and train order, uh, was there must have been a period uh, before you ripped out the old AM that uh, you had an idea and a plan that ready to go ahead. You just didn't rip it out and say, "All right, what do I do now?" Well, you know, the I guess I think like an engineer because that was my training, but. Uh... You know, I was right in the middle on the Allegheny Midland of daylighting the south end of the north end staging yard to make it more accessible and make it a kind of a visible yard. And I was rebuilding that, that whole area, scenicing it. I was putting a lot of time and money into that. And right in the middle of that, I said, oh, I, th- <laughs> I think I'll just tear this all down and build the nickel plate. And I would really like to have a uh, you know, a transcript of the mental thought processes that were going on <laughs> at that time, because uh, you know that looking back at that, that just doesn't sound very logical. You know, where, where you're right in the middle of a a pretty neat project that I could have seen through, would have made some nice photographs. I got photographs of it as work in progress that I've shared in my books. Um, but it wouldn't have taken a whole lot more effort to finish that up and uh, get some mileage out of that. But I, we never uh, we, we never got to the point where uh, it was actually used. So there must have been a time that for some reason the railroad was not operational because of me tearing into that south end of the north end staging. And uh, at... at there must have just been some trigger that happened there and said, oh, wait a minute, you know, this this is probably just as good a time as any. We're not operating regularly anymore. Let's just uh, clean slate the whole thing. I wish I remembered in some detail what the uh, relays kicking in one at a time were like. But, uh, <laughs> what, all, what all the chattering going on? Click, click, click. click yeah, click, the, click, yeah click, there we go. Exactly. Boom. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, uh, How would I, interesting. I, was, uh, I, I know you picked the nickel plate uh, because you had some childhood interest in it. Your dad, uh, I believe, was a manager of Brickyard on the nickel plate, which uh, I, I, I would imagine kind of, uh, uh, you know, getting back to the boyhood memories and trying to replicate some of that uh, has obviously played a large uh, part in what you decided to do. Well, yeah, that and the fact that I'd founded the Nickel Plate Society and and had started amassing a huge amount of data on the Nickel Plate and, and was beginning to be associated strongly with the Nickel Plate. And we were having regular national conventions, and I was meeting some real movers and shakers of, in the employee end of things. So it was taking on a huge amount of momentum all on its own. And... uh the Nickel Plate Society uh, was growing in leaps and bounds, and it was causing me to learn how to publish a magazine that led to my employment at RMC. So there was all this going on in the background, uh, but uh, I had to drop all that because of the work at RMC it was just too much for me to also do the uh, Nickel Plate stuff in the background. So I kind of walked away from it and actually missed some conventions and stuff like that for a while. But then uh, I began to really miss it and got back into it big time. And and uh, very glad I did because, uh, you know, it, it, it's become it's like model railroading. It becomes a family, an extended family of people that uh, you really miss. We had our uh, 
convention last year was canceled because of the COVID concerns. And, and uh, we reran the same exact convention format in Cincinnati this year. But attention or uh, attendance was down uh, for probably two or three reasons. I think people were still concerned about COVID. Uh, Cincinnati was on a branch of the nickel plate that's uh, kind of a stretch. And uh, there was some competing nickel plate steam activity up in Fort Wayne that weekend. And uh, so attendance was down, and we probably lost a little money on the convention, which very unusual. Um, but nonetheless, we got together with old friends, and and it was a very good feeling to be able to do that. So, uh, uh, you know, there was a, uh, yeah, there was a lot of, of family involvement. My dad was not a nickel plate fan at all because of the trouble he had with the nickel plate shipping and breaking his brick, as I mentioned in a previous podcast. But uh, uh, <laughs> he wasn't a rail fan either. But uh, he did ride the nickel plate to St. Louis and back one time. So at least uh, there was some connection there. But uh, my mom was more of the rail fan, as I mentioned before. So uh, there was some family involvement there. But the uh, nickel plate was just a magic thing to a kid that was. Oh, I must have been uh, nine years old when I first saw it, and those big Berkshires made a big impression on a kid. So, mm, okay, so now uh, the the current RMC editor Otto, are are you are we too are you too busy for us, Otto, or what's happening here, buddy? Otto, Otto's Otto's struggling with his. Uh, Otto's having technical difficulties. You know, Otto's having technical difficulties now. He's pressing buttons. I can see him. Without seeing him, I can see him feverishly pushing buttons. I imagine like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain with <laughs> yeah, all the levers yeah. going. <laughs> uh, and what were you saying there? Don't don't blush. Uh, you've done too much for the hobby. You do, you need to take a break. Uh, well, how how do you um how do you uh, how do you come up with your next? Now, do you have a list of ideas of things that you want? Like uh, okay, MRP. Do you have uh, two years out worth of MRP? Do you have somewhere in a in a notebook like oh, I want to cover this, I want to cover that, I want? Do you how off how far out do you plan MRP? Like do you you must have? I mean, I know it's a podcast. Am I am I rambling, Dave? A little little bit. Let, let's <laughs> let's. I mean, basically, I think you asked the question already. So let's hear what the answer is. Okay. Well, all right. Well, right now there's probably fifty articles in the queue that I can choose from, and there's only about twelve of them that can make. The next issue. Now, of those 50 articles, uh, not all of them are ready for prime time. So if I tossed out all of those that need a lot of work to get ready for prime time, uh, there's probably twice as many as I need for the next issue that are reasonably close to being ready. And there's probably five or six or seven of those that are fully ready to go into the next issue. So they're all done. Um, but, uh, just because they're done doesn't mean they're going to get in the next issue because with an annual issue, it's quite different than a monthly because you got to look at the demographics. Do you have N, uh, maybe S, do you have O, do you have large scale covered? Do you have Northwest, uh, Southwest, central part of the country? Do you have the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast covered? Uh, do you have, uh, you know, early era, do you have steam era, do you have 70s, 80s, 90s, do you have modern stuff covered? It's really hard to touch all those demographics in a given issue, but you got to try. And, uh, for example, in the uh, issue that's coming out this year, uh, in January next year, or rather, um, it dawned on me that we had not taken a real hard look at what's available in S-scale. Uh, I'm curious about things like that. You know what? If you know O scale is kind of big, H O scale gets smaller every day. Um, as does N scale for the people who are getting older. Um, S scale has always been kind of the magic size, and we could have gotten a, along very nicely with T T scale and S scale and nothing else. That could, those two would have been very nice, but that's just <laughs> not how the, how the the dice rolled. 
And so I was very curious about really what is available in Eskale and what are the problems. So Brooks Stover is the Eskale go-to guy. And even he didn't know all the answers, but he found them, found out about them. And it turns out there's a couple of factions in Oskale. There's the uh, really scale guys and there's the really tin plate guys, but there's kind of a middle faction uh, that they call high rail. But when you say high rail, you kind of get into, you think, like Lionel, but it's not those guys. That's tin plate. That's another faction. And uh, so I said, let's talk about that. So Brooks did his homework and dug it all out. And it turns out you can get modern GVOs and you can get all kinds of neat stuff. And uh, Brooks has got this beautiful Buffalo Creek and vol- uh, Golly. And it turns out he's been using this higher rail track all the time and I never noticed. So. Uh, that was an article that was commissioned because the editor got nosy about what the possibilities are for those of us who are uh, getting older and may have eyesight problems or shaky hands problems like I've got. Uh, my eyes are getting better because I had cataract surgery, and so they're twenty twenty, and with good reading glasses or magnifiers, I can see what I need to see, but with my shaky hands, H.O., is a bit of a problem. I'm not going to tear down my railroad and start over because of that, but some other people might be. And O scale eats up a lot of room pretty quick. Um, so maybe F scale is an answer. So I, I commissioned that article. Um, most of the time, uh, MRP has been around long enough that I've got a pretty good balance of stuff, but I may, um, I may find that I don't have N scale material or don't have something on the Pacific Northwest, but I know somebody that's doing something like that, and I'll get a hold of them and say, hey, uh, write about this, and, and they'll get a hold of me. Uh, I mentioned before that sitting, waiting in front of the mailbox for something to come in is not a real good uh, methodology, but uh, when the magazine's been around as long as MRP has, uh, I'm in pretty good shape that way. Otto, can you hear us? Otto. Auto. <laughs> I see his O, his o flashing. But his O is flashing, yeah. There's a lot of flashing going on. Auto. <laughs> he's got a couple of really good questions for you, too. Uh, he he's just up. disappeared. He's going to go out and come in again. Oh, he's coming in again. All right, let's see what happens this time. <laughs> Auto. 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 <laughs> Nothing. Hello. There he is. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, you know, Otto. I have been, and the crowd goes wild, <laughs> and the crowd goes nuts. I've been knocking and 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 trying to get out of that closet in the green room for the last hour and a half, guys. Ah, <laughs> oh. you, you should you should have texted. <laughs> yeah, he kept he kept uh, everybody. I kept saying, "What are you let now?" And they kept on, "No, not yet, not yet." Now, <laughs> now. <laughs> hey, Otto, I remember you said you had a couple of really good questions you wanted to ask uh, Mr. Custer. So if you've got them handy, do you remember what they were? Uh, yes. Um, hi, Tony. Good to see you again. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for coming in. Um, so, again, this is a huge honor for me. You know, I, I everyone's lining up to thank you. And I, I, we talked about this last time, too. But you know, you're responsible in a large part for my career today. And I'm, I owe a debt of gratitude to you. And I thank you. Um, I get 10%. I, and we just make sure the check's clear every month. And, and that's, that's very good. Um, but my, my question is, and, and we touched on this a little bit in the last episode where I tried to explain to our listeners what I felt the relationship was between model railroader and railroad model craftsman and how into the 1950s and into the 1960s, they both really spoke with different voices, um, as they should. But I always felt that, and and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel that Hal Karstens, who was the publisher and was the editor for many years, I always felt that Railroad Model Craftsman was, was influenced by two factors, one being Hal really enjoyed having a cozy relationship with the manufacturers themselves you know your 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 Irv Atherns of the world your Kramer brothers you know he he enjoyed that side of the business and i also got the feeling his background as a 
uh, tin plate collector and toy train collector um, and that aspect also influenced the magazine because I always felt if you picked up a copy of of Model Craftsman in the 50s or 60s, if there was such a thing as tin plate HO, I felt that that was the kind of the style that was being pushed for better or for worse. But I feel that when you came on board and, and, and took the helm, we really saw a transformation more with a focus towards the scale modeling, the prototype modeling, you know, sneaking in Jim Boyd with a with a prototype feature here and there, more more up to date modern uh, drawings like Alco Centuries or GE U boats, things like that. What were the biggest changes that that you made to the magazine coming in when you took over? Well, Hal had been running prototype drawings like U boats and stuff like that, but they they he depended strictly on the draftsman for the accuracy and when i took over i knew some real experts in the field like jerry moyers and preston cook and that and so i would run the drawings by them to try to improve them considerably and i remember spending hours with an electric erasing machine uh moving handrails and louvers and stuff like that to fix things um but that was relatively minor um I did not think the tin plate had a place in railroad model craftsman at all. Um, so um, I did my very best to weed that out of the magazine. I just didn't think um, with the few pages that we had then, it was a 68-page magazine when I came there in January 69. Um, I just didn't think that it was contributing to the sales of the magazine at all. I was probably wrong at that. Uh, that the uh, it turns out the tin plate's a huge, huge market. Uh, maybe we should. Well, Hal had had a magazine called Toy Trains. I mean, Hal hadn't had it. Charlie Charlie Penn had had it before that, but it had lost money hand over fist, and that's how come Hal got control of RMC was that he and Phyllis and her family and his family had bought out that debt was an option to buy RMC. And when the opportunity arose, there's some um, clandestine stuff in the background that I'm not going to get into. But when the option to buy RMC came up, he exercised that option to buy. And he bought out Charlie Penn. And Charlie Penn bought the town of Bumblebee, Arizona, lock, stock, and barrel. And Hal and his Studebaker helped Charlie move out there. And that's how... How got uh, control of RMC was uh, because of the uh, money that Toy Trains Magazine lost. It was very much like Kalmbach lost a lot of money on Model Trains Magazine. So, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Um, and and the, for people uh, who don't know, Tony, uh, Charles Penn was the was the publisher of Railroad Model Craftsman um, almost from the start in 1933 until 1963, I think my notes say here. Yeah, he was Penn Publications, and then Hal changed it to Model Craftsman, and then uh, finally to uh, Karsten's Publications. Um, the uh, other change I made was to insist that the cover had to match a story inside the magazine. Hal just arbitrarily stuck pretty pictures on the cover. And uh, then I once I had that nailed down, um, I started to insist that they be model pictures on the cover, not prototype. And ironically, one of my own prototype pictures was on the cover, not, you know, before I even went out there. But uh, I just didn't think that was appropriate. Now, as far as Jim Boyd and prototype articles, that was uh, Hal's doing. Uh, it filled pages. And that was one of the reasons I actually went to work for Hal was I saw that Jim was doing those prototype roster shots as he was moving around the country, uh, delivering diesels for General Motors. That was his job. He would then shoot these roster articles because he had permission to be in the railroad yards. And then he'd sell them to Hal. And I thought, well, if he did that, I could do that. So I did that on the South Shore. And so when I went out to Hal to talk to him about founding Railfan Magazine, as we talked about earlier, um, Hal knew that I knew how to take photographs and things like that even though the article hadn't been published yet. Uh, so Jim Boyd was a 
direct uh, influence on me being hired by Hal, and then I was a direct influence about Jim being hired by Hal. Did you see a big shift right away? Were there articles that you said that you saw like there's things I'm interested in that are missing from this magazine? Like, was there were, were you on a mission to to transform it, or did it happen over time? And I got a follow up to that. Did like did Al Carson's give you any blowback, or did you just kind of have a free reign to do whatever you wanted? I don't remember getting any pushback from Hal at all. Uh, he it really surprised me. I mean, as I'd mentioned before, I. I came in there as an associate editor, and I think that lasted a year. But uh, I was really expecting to be the kid that went out for coffee and donuts. And uh, I was essentially handled, handed the magazine uh, within months. Uh, I remember the first job he gave me was to write, uh, you know, 10 or 20 pages of questions and answers for troubleshooting column. And I said, what do you mean questions and answers? And he says, yeah, questions and answers. And I thought, oh, I didn't know that's the way that worked. Um, Here, I thought we had reader questions come in and we wrote the answers. Um, But it was a good way to test whether I knew anything. And uh, then Bill Shop's drawings, as I mentioned before, his track plans were horrible ink drawings with Leroy lettering. And so I redrew all those with color overlays for the scenery and typeset for the lettering and stuff like that. So uh, I got real busy and cleaned up the magazine real fast graphically. And uh, the uh, art director, Vi Caps, was only too happy to let me uh, start doing the layouts. And she taught me a couple things that I was doing wrong. And uh, she was right and I was wrong. And uh, so once I mastered a couple of the real uh, minor points of layout design, uh, I've got a good, strong artistic background, so it wasn't hard to figure that out. And uh, so I was off and running. And, uh, you know, essentially the file cabinets were in my office with all the articles in them. They weren't in Hal's office. So he had no control over uh, what was going in the magazine at all. Uh, anything that came in the mail got shuffled up to my office upstairs in the Art Street building in Ramsey. And, uh, so it was uh, pretty much my ball game right off the bat, which surprised the hell out of me. <laughs> um, I don't remember getting any pushback or chewing out about anything. Uh, I'm sure I did. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we certainly had our strong differences of opinion, but I don't remember them being on uh, content or anything like that. Tony, some of the some of the columns I remember from from that era were things like um, One Evening Project and End Scale Niche and probably a couple others. I'm for Protofile. I know you and I have talked about Protofile. Um, How how did, how did some of those come about? Well, just, you know, I mean, it's a kind of obvious sort of thing that you think about, you know, like, Hey, this could be done in one evening and I can make a clock out of the zero and, or out of the O and one. And, and, uh, That'd be a neat thing. Waldo Levski was doing some easy kind of things, and you you look for ways of packaging things. Uh, Editor's Notebook started when um, I did a review of an all-nation O-scale boxcar kit, and his stamped roofs had little, where the stamping came down at each of the four corners of the roof, there was a little uh, projection down in the corners that needed to be filed off, and I made a drawing showing where you wanted to file that off. No big deal. Well, Bob Colson of All Nation got ticked off because I did that. And I thought that was pretty <laughs> petty. But Hal said, okay, look, get on an airplane, go out to Chicago, shake hands with Bob Colson, then fly down to St. Louis, rent a car, and go out to um, Effingham, Illinois, where World Color Press was, and see the printing plant. So I went down, I did all that, and uh, when I was in St. Louis, I visited Bill Clouser, the famous trolley guy, and Bill Clouser was probably Paul Larson, the former editor of Mars Only Friends, so that's where I figured out all the history on Paul Larson, how he uh, how his untimely demise as editor of MR and why and what and all that stuff that I won't get into. Um, but I got to see Bill's old scale fine-scale uh, Illinois Traction. Illinois terminal modeling, 
and saw the printing plant at work, and they showed me how the uh, high-speed web with big rolls of paper spinning and how they made it one roll onto the other while it didn't work and paper was scattered all over the plant. And uh, uh, so I had a fun fun trip. But when I got home, uh, I had pictures from the trip that I didn't know what to do with. And Hal was still writing the editorial notes on an old timetable up front, which he did to the end. And uh, I wasn't the editor. I was probably by that time pretty close to being promoted to managing editor. Uh, so I created a column called Editor's Notebook for the back, and that gave me a catch-all place to hide, to stick uh, all these photos and anecdotes and stuff like that, funny stories and all that stuff. And uh, that that worked out really well, so that's how all that came about. You know, it's, it's interesting what you mentioned about Hal being relatively hands-off. I only had the opportunity to meet him once or twice. Um, I was actually living in Rochester at the time, when I started writing for uh, Bill Schomburg and then, um, you know, he had me start doing some technical drawings and, and, and layout designs and things kind of snowballed and, you know, and Bill would be like, anytime you're in the office, you know, anytime you're in the area, come on down. And yeah, I'd, I'd come down to Newton and um, got to poke my head in uh, once or twice and, uh, or I bumped into Hal in the hallway and got introduced. Um, and it was funny when I, when I got hired by Karsten's, this is just a short story um, I got hired more or less by by Steve Barry to come and work full time on Railfan and Railroad as an associate editor and as an art director. Um, and I'd already been doing some work on the side and was a contractor and all this. And um, Steve had me come down to Newton, or, or at the yeah, um, came up to Newton at the time actually because I'd moved back to Westchester. Came up to Newton. Um, he's like, "Hey, let's go out to lunch." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." Hopped in his car. We drove around Newton and he's like, oh, here's where the Lackawanna Sussex branch used to be. And, oh, here's the old Lackawanna Freight House. And you know, we drove around, looked at a couple more railroad landmarks. I'm like, okay, okay. We uh, you know, went to lunch, came back, and um, that, that, that was it. And I went home and I said, oh, I, I, guess, I guess I got hired. Yeah. I, I found out. Driving you or Steve? That, that was Steve. And I okay. found out years later, that's how Hal hired Steve Barry. Yes. Steve just Hal's like come out to lunch, and Hal drove him around and showed him where the Sussex branch was and the freight house and this and that, and that 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 was the entire interview. So I think if you if you uh, that seems to be tradition, just uh, uh, they kind of take a look at you and they said, uh, "Hey kid, I think you got it." And they just give you the magazine. <laughs> My interview with Hal was was similar to that when when Jim Boyd interviewed. Uh, we went to his house in Upper Saddle River, and his one of his girls threw us a pair of bathing suits, and we jumped in the pool <laughs> and that was that was that interview but they served you know potato chip dip in the in the midwest potato chip dip there's a law that's written in every state constitution that says it's got to be french onion dip well on the <laughs> east coast you can have herring dip oh well we didn't know that and so jim Jim took a big swig of herring dip and almost drowned in the pool. Uh huh. That's a little bit different flavor and consistency there. Oh who's, my God! Who, whose pool? And, uh, whose pool did you jump in? Hal Carson's pool in who, Upper who, Saddle River. Whose swimsuits were you wearing? He, probably his, which would have fit Jim. And uh, so, at any rate, uh, you know that's that's the typical Carson's interview was something and. Uh, you know, completely informal kind of ridiculous interview. I mean, the interview was, a, you wouldn't have been invited to the interview if you weren't going to be hired, I guess. Right, right. It. Um, it's actually a funny story how I started working for Karsten's. Um, I had I had graduated college. I was working my first job, and I was really starting to get more active in modeling and rail fanning and everything. And I had an idea to write a story about the old Rochester subway and about how you could model it. And the Rochester subway was a, was a trolley line that was built in the, in the bed of the Erie canal going through Rochester, not unlike the Newark subway in Newark, New Jersey. Um, so I, on a whim, I, I just, I pitch, uh, I don't know why I didn't pitch model railroader. I, I pitched Bill Schomburg at railroad model crafts when I wrote him an email said, I have this idea. He said, sounds great. Write it up. A couple months later, I pack up all my slides, my text, I mail it off. And um, 
<laughs> I always tell this story, and I think it embarrasses Bill a little bit, but I hope not because it's funny. He writes me back to acknowledge that he got uh, the package. And, um, you know, in conversation, he's just like, oh, make sure you say, make sure you say hi to your dad. And I thought, oh, yeah. I'm like, that's, <laughs> yeah, Tony knows. Know and I'm like, my, <laughs> I'm like my dad. I'm like, that. I'm like, how do you know my dad? He's like, oh, you're, you know, your, your dad, Ed Vondrak. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> oh no, that's, that's a different Ed Vondrak. It's the same family, but he's, he's a cousin. Uh, no, that's, that's not my dad. And then Bill's like, oh, um. Okay, got to go. Bye. And that was, <laughs> I am convinced that because of that, because of that little mix up, I, I that's how I got published and getting published. You know, I had some scale drawings in that article and that led to bills like, hey, can you do some tech drawings for us? Can you design some, uh, can you draw up some track plans for it? I just snowballed and everything else. And, but if it wasn't that little mix up, I don't think I ever would have gotten the job or gotten published. And that was uh, that was August two thousand. If you want to look it up, it's it's called Rochester's Orphan Subway. And that was that was my debut. Actually, that was my first time getting published anywhere outside of getting the stray photo here or there in Railpace. That was my first article published ever. What was your first article published in uh, in Model Railroad, or Tony? Just remind everybody. Oh lordy, wasn't that, it? Was the Allegheny Midland, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I don't remember the first one. But I do remember one of the covers, and it's hilarious. There was a shot at the Sunrise Engine Terminal, and there was a steam engine. And it was one of the X N and W X Wheeling Lake Erie 482s. And they had a reputation of being really rough riding engines uh, because the main rod connected to the third set of drivers instead of the second set. And I mentioned this in the caption that they had a reputation. Uh, for being rough riding engines, but I didn't get into any details. And my buddy Randy Brown, who used to live in Jersey, but he lives up in Peterborough, New Hampshire now, wrote into MR and he says, I think I understand why they're rough riding engine. The first set of drivers is on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Joining the likes of the great John Allen with the photos in MR with track, uh, trucks off the rails. Yeah, MR is real sensitive about wheels been on the ground ever since then i mean they they uh apparently ha have a guy that's well probably not now because they've downsized but uh, they even had um had an f unit that one of the guys in the art department put a martian in yes. the cab looking at oh them. yes we've we've heard yes the tales we've heard of that yes and uh that's you know it's well i remember our art department uh wayne daniels uh had a wicked sense of humor. He was he should have been on Broadway. He was a born actor. And he prepared all the ad copy for some advertisers, including Nickel Plate Products. And uh that was Dave Simon was a, our uh, he did our eyeglasses for us. He was an optometrist in Chicago, but he also ran Nickel Plate Products and Wayne came up with this um uh, you know, ad for Nickel Plate Products about the you know, this these brass imports from the folks who brought your World War II and, you know, stuff like that. Copy. <laughs> there was just fake copy, but supposed to be humorous. And I think that's the only time I ever chewed Wayne out from stem to stern because I had this visions of somehow this friggin' ad getting into print and uh, us being <laughs> sued into oblivion. Uh, so I don't think Wayne ever did that again, but... Uh, Boy, it's, it's just so easy for something that's a joke to get carried a little too far. Uh, that Martian thing on the cover of MR, that was not looked upon with any those in charge. No, it wasn't. There were some people. I don't know whether anybody got fired or not, but it, the heads rolled. Did you ever meet Lynn Westcott? Did I meet Lynn Westcott? I asked you first. <laughs> yes, I, I knew Lynn re reasonably well. Uh, not to where it was Tony and Lynn. Um, I even met Al Kalmbach. Uh, the, uh, Al, by the time I met him, we invited him to the Purdue Railroad Club. I was the president, and he was in a wheelchair. I think he had Alzheimer's, but I'm not sure. He had something, muscular dystrophy, something like that. And uh, he was in a wheelchair, and I suspect his wife was wheeling him around to the—it uh, was a big— 
club day in the Purdue Student Union, and all the clubs had exhibits, and uh, he was there. And uh, so I greeted him, and I said, uh, we're just a bunch of young college kids, but I said, I think you should be aware that all of us are aware that there's uh, the hobby of model railroading almost uniquely has this very high ethical standard in print and in advertising, and it seems to be emanating from Kalmbach's uh, very high advertising standards, and, and obviously you're the one behind it. And even a snotty young college kids understand things like that, and, and we want to thank you for it. And it's one of my happier moments in life. Uh, Bill Walters uh, also came down to the Purdue Rural Club. He was a real short little guy. And uh, he came down to the club on his way to Louisville. Uh, we invited him down. He came down to say hi. So I met both of them. Lynn, uh, I, I watched him give several clinics and that. He was kind of an enigma. Uh, I don't think he understood who he was. Uh, he gave a clinic at a national or regional, probably a national, on how to scratch build a turnout. And, you know, how do you, how do, you do that at a national convention? Um, so he had a closed circuit television rigged up with screens up on the wall. And, you know, that's, that's not what people come to national conventions to see Len Westcott talk about. They want him to tell them funny stories about model railroad or, I mean, to give him a Lionel Strang clinic. I've seen Lionel, uh, give talks and, and that's the kind of talk that you want to be having Len Westcott give him about his trips to Japan and, all these kind of things. And here Lynn was given a stupid talk on scratch building turnouts and his model railroad, the Sunset Valley Navigation, Sun Railway Navigation Company, I think it was, um, was, you know, it was just a, an engineering base for Elgerter bench work and hard shell scenery and, and zip texturing and all that kind of thing. It never developed into a railroad at all. And Paul Larson, his predecessor, had a really neat railroad and uh, Mineral Point Northern. And somewhere at that point between Paul's hasty departure and Lynn taking over, at that point in time, MR became kind of a um, tutorial magazine. Um, and it never got back an editor who was building a model railroad first and foremost and was sharing his model railroad with us. And I always thought that that was a component that was missing. And I bu busted Andy Sprandio's butt on that on numerous occasions. And I finally got him to write about his model railroad and model railroad planning. And I could not believe that that, it, that article wasn't in model railroad or, you know, you know, I, I agree with you, Tony, and I think you hit on a lot of the points where, and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a criticism, but it's, I think Lynn Westcott took a laboratory approach to the hobby. He was very smart. He came up with a lot of, or he, he helped develop or advance a lot of the concepts we take for granted today. Um, but he, I think he looked at his own model railroad as just a laboratory to test those concepts. Every time, and I and and we struggle with this too. You know, people ask like, "Hey Otto, do an article on this." Hey Otto, go write an article on that. And I said, "Well, we don't. Very rarely do we write the articles. We want the readers to contribute. You know, this is you don't subscribe to RMC to hear from me every month. You're you're, it's a forum for our fellow modelers. But that said, whenever we got to peek behind the curtain, um, I loved uh, reading about Jim Hedegar's Ohio Southern. You know, I loved reading about, you know, Andy's, you know, Santa Fe. I loved seeing that the editors were like us and that they were building model railroads like us and that they had the same challenges and they had very specific interests that they were zeroed in on. Like, I love Jim Hedegar's layout. He built a double deck layout for himself. He wasn't like, I'm going to pioneer the concept of a double deck layout. He's like, this is just what I want. Well, that's, um, not, quite, that's not quite true. He, okay. He was told by Lynn Westcott to build a double deck railroad. <laughs> Darn it! <laughs> at a dinner, at a lunch between Lynn and John and uh, and uh, and Jim, the three of them, and Lynn said, "Jim, why don't you go build a double deck model railroad um, to pioneer the concept?" And uh, so Jim did. Um, 
And let me hasten, hasten to add here, you know, it sounds like I'm throwing bricks at MR, and I don't mean to do that. MR has got a huge circulation by any print magazine hobby standard today. So obviously those guys have figured out some kind of a formula uh, that really works. Uh, you know, the criticism that you hear most from veteran model railroaders is that it's it's aimed at the uh, less experienced model railroader, but maybe those are the guys that really need the help. And, and uh, so they may have the magic formula all figured out. Um, and who am I to say that, that uh, they're doing anything in any way, shape, or form wrong? So I don't mean to imply that. No, not at all. I don't think all. you are. No, I don't think you are. Tony, actually, something you just hit on. I, I learned something uh, from you from one of your editorials. You talked about reading. Uh, you just you were interested in sailing, and you picked up a sailing magazine, and you were able to pick up on some basic terminology and technique because they took the time to explain, and there were some um, charts to show how you would cut a sail for different, you know, whatever happens in sailing. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you had explained how, like, they they pulled away some of the mystery by not dumbing down the content, but they they just assumed that everyone picking up the magazine did not already know how to sail, and that the people reading this were always looking to continually improve or learn or whatever. And I've always made a point that any time that we introduce something in RMC, you know, all too, you know, one of the laziest things we do is we talk about, you know, I put on a drop of CA. Well, what's CA? Is it California? Is it, you know, what is it? Right. So I always make a point to spell out it's cyanacrylate in parentheses, CA. Um, can I anytime, interfere? Can I interrupt yeah. here? Yeah. That's exactly what this podcast is. Oftentimes people will say something and I'll say, well, what is that? And when in fact I already know, but that's exactly the my bugaboo about model railroaders who refuse to pull back the curtain. You got to let people know what you're talking, because there are so many people out there that are in some that are, if, the, if model railroading runs from A to, to Z, there are people in between that don't know. Well, and, and, and even, even Tony's own example in, in that same editorial was, I mean, Tony, you, you were talking about how you were a little kid and you're picking up one of the magazines and they talk about drilling and tapping a hole and you're like, well, I know what a drill is, but why would you tap on it when you're done with it? Or, you know, and should that article have explained in parentheses, hey, you're going to ream this out so it has, you know, um, your your treads to pick up on the screw head or, or you know, whatever, however you want to explain it. But, you know, you mentioning that in that, in that editorial 20, 30 years ago, I've done that in my own personal writing. Um, we've even gotten to the point, and again, I'm I'm 44 this year. We're we're at the point where we are so far removed, even from um, the mergers of what we call the modern era. You know, anytime we talk about Conrail, you know, on the rail fan side, I put in parentheses, you know, Conrail parentheses the the uh, amalgamation of six bankrupt railroads in 1976. You can't assume people know what Conrail is. You can't assume that people know what Erie Lackawanna is. You can't assume. Um, and especially if you're going to talk about in the context where it's like, oh, Conrail had all these engines and and they had all these paint outs, they had all this. Well, why did they have all these engines and paint outs? Oh, because they're the amalgamation of six different bankrupt railroads. Um, we 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 can't assume that people even know that. You know, sometimes we talk about Amtrak, and I have to put in parentheses. You know, the government took over passenger trains in 1971. Whatever we can do to give people that little that little bit of key information and not dumb down the magazines at the same time. Um, you know, I, I got into trouble, Tony, a couple of years ago, we did a, a project railroad. We built a commuter railroad on some modules. Um, and that. thank you. And I, I was really proud of the work because I, I thought it was bringing back project railroads to the magazine. It was a, it was a concept no one had done before who builds a passenger railroad, but it was, I, I took a couple articles and I described here's how you knock together a basic module and, and some and some legs. Here's how you lay down some cork. And and I didn't show step by step and explain step by step, but I did explain. I took the plywood, I painted it brown, I put down a bead of caulk, I put down some cork. I, I, 
the letters we got that we were dumbing down the magazine and, and how dare we do this and how dare we do that. Hmm. Um, and then all of these letters were prefaced by, I've been in this hobby for 60 years or, or whatever it is. And it's like, well, guess there's nothing new we can teach you then. <laughs> what, yeah. Hey, Dave, what's the newest thing you've learned in the last little while? Dave? Well, I did I wake you up? <laughs> there, I I have to admit I I might have, I might have nodded off. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I blame Ooh. myself. I no, oh my god! It, it, I mean, are you kidding? I'm just the. This is like to be able to sit, Bruce. Wouldn't you agree to be able uh, to sit uh, here and be part of this? This is just fantastic. I I, I just sent Lionel the text. This is great. You listen. This to is the, fantastic. Listen to these these guys talk and but I think give, you know give some insight what's going on. It's one of the things. One of the <laughs> one of the things that I'm learning here is again you know the, the continuity like what 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 Otto's talking about yeah he's hitting all the buttons tony tony is he's the reason a lot of us are here and the continuity that we're all able to draw from assumes a foundation and that foundation in a lot of ways is what tony communicated and what tony created i mean it's it's what he communicated alan mcclelland you know he took a lot of the early foundational people in the hobby that we've talked about for now five podcasts, right? Six. Six. This is the sixth. But Tony made that, he, he got that out to the masses in on, in the two biggest names in the hobby, Model Railroad or Rare Model Craftsman. Or what was the other one you wanted, Lionel? You wanted M Railroad Model Craftsman? Oh, no, I want, no, it's rail, rail Fan and Railroad or Railroad and Rail. Oh, fan. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got <sighs> That's a no, uh, that I, is a total no brainer. Oh no, I just I just had to tap that keg, you know. So <laughs> I already anyway. told him we're just going to rename it Railfin and Railroad Model Crest and just be done with it. <laughs> but I, but I, you know, again, I, you know, I, I think Lionel said his thanks. Otto, you know, certainly, certainly has I think has, has touched on a lot of that. But I'm I'm personally grateful, Tony, for your leadership in the hobby for so many years and for being available to so many of us as is we've all gotten started in our own special way our own little way, you know, in the hobby. And as that's grown, you know, I, I, I think something you should carry with you forever is, is, is the fact that one of the reasons this hobby is going to continue and why it's going to continue to grow, because I think that's true, um, is because of you. So I, I'm, I'm grateful. I really am. Well, I, I think Dave hit on something um, that, that we can't thank Tony enough for is that, you know, he does make himself available. Um, I know, traveling to shows, traveling to conventions, making appearances. It's, it's not easy. Um, everyone thinks you just kind of roll up to a convention and, you know, whip out your PowerPoint and make it look so easy. There's a lot of prep. There's a lot of work. Um, traveling is exhausting. Um, meeting people, talking to people. I remember one time years ago, I was, I was working on a project. Now I was actually at the Carson's offices and I was saying, Oh, I'm trying to finish this thing. And I really need, you know, this one photo and I don't know where to get it. And someone's like, well, just call up Tony. He's in town. I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you. And I'll just give you the photo. And I'm like, what do you mean? Call up Tony Custer. I don't know him. I, I, um, I had just invited myself to his house one time back in the 80s. <laughs> I just wanted like, to bring, you know, on. why, am, why yeah. am I not surprised by <laughs> that story? But I mean, but that's, but I mean, that was, <laughs> hey, Dave. You know, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Dave, 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 Dave. How do you think I've done now? Uh, we've done, uh, you've been here for, uh, Bruce, is it not true that we try to be as transparent here at the old AML as possible? We, we do try to be like a sheet of glass. We try to be, wow, I like that. Like a sheet of glass, like a, like a, like a uh, perfectly clean sheet of glass. Yes. Like Lexon. We're like Lexon. You can hit us, but we will not break. But you can see through us. Okay, or maybe uh, not. Or Lex I just, Lex I just oh, Lex want to be sure yeah. that you're done with nickel plate questions, so you don't ask me back. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and 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 to to put a bow on to put a bow on what I was saying, it was just that you know everyone's like, oh, just just call up Tony and 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 he'll help you out, and it never occurred to me that you know, and not even specifically Tony, but like just reaching out to a stranger or someone you don't know, and even though you have that common interest and you're reaching out to someone with a legitimate reason. It's like, I, I don't want to, I don't know Tony. I'm sure Tony gets bothered by people all the time and I don't want to add on to that. But you know, I, what is, what is emblemic of this hobby is that we are all willing to. Emblemic. Hang on. Emblemic. 
I, I may have just have made you up ever a word. have you ever listened to this ever to listen it's, to this podcast? Em, em, it's I think a, the emblematic, I think, is what it's you're a perfectly for. cromulent word. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, Otto, we got a uh, uh, Bruce. So we're we're perfectly transparent, are we not? Yes, yes, yes. We try to. Yes, Dave, yes, you've yes, been here are. for the entire uh, uh, forty-seven part, uh, six part, forty-seven part trilogy. It's been beautiful. I have yes, and uh, you know me pretty well, Dave. Bruce, you I, know me pretty well. I I've do. known you for a few number of years. Yeah, you guys know me pretty well, and you know that I uh, I have a tendency to speak out. Yes. Uh, I, I, uh, oh, sorry. Did I say that too quickly? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, too quickly. <laughs> sorry. Could you, could you, could you, at least kind of. Um, <laughs> yeah well yeah but i'm pretty proud of myself because there's one question i've wanted to ask right from the get-go and i think now this is going to be the absolute qu last question of this entire process and tony i want you to put a lot of thought into this question because there's really only one right answer uh are you ready dave uh, are you ready bruce oh i'm ready for this one are here you, we go this, are, this yes this are you ready tony i think so all right in all the years that you've been a part of model railroading and all the hundreds of articles you've written and all the thousands of articles you've read and the people you've met, but prim primarily all the journal model railroad journalists you've met over the years, uh, is there one particular author that ever stood out to you? It has to be Lionel Strang. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Beauty. He smacked her right over the center field ball there. It's another LinkedIn homer. <laughs> I, waited, uh, I waited 12 hours to say that. <laughs> that was brilliant. That was brilliant. There you go. <laughs> well, I think that's it. What did you think, Tony? I mean, holy mackerel, you couldn't have made yourself more available. What, did you, what do you think of our little podcast after all this carrying on? Well, I've enjoyed doing it. It's always fun to get together with you guys, and I wish I could do more of it in person. I do get to see Dave uh, pretty regularly, uh, particularly now that uh, COVID seems halfway under control. And uh, we'd have gotten together yesterday if his kids hadn't uh, had a little flare-up of uh, uh, strep, but uh, we'll do it again. So, uh it's been a very enjoyable experience. I've gotten a chance to listen to at least the first of the podcasts, and uh, they turned out better than I would have imagined. So, uh, <laughs> well done, Lionel. Well done. <laughs> How did I sound? How did I sound? Terrible. <laughs> I wasn't asking you. Well, oh, Lionel's well, got a radio announcer type voice. I used to have for my throat got a little scratchy, but uh, at any rate, uh, it uh, it's been a hoot, and I hope that uh, you get some good reaction. I hope that we haven't worn out our welcome. And uh, sometime down the road, maybe we can do this again. Absolutely. And we have had a great reaction. Your your part one reached uh, the mo most number of uh, downloads uh, faster than any other pot, uh, episode we've done. And I mean, I've been on most of them, which surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> Transparency uh, is such a wonderful thing. Okay. Yes. Okay, Tony. So now you have to do the email address. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just uh, uh, Bruce. Yes, sir. Could you give our our email address? Why, well, certainly. And I, I, I would be glad to uh, when, uh, if everybody <laughs> wants to write write in and let us know what they've thought of this. We, uh, we've caught you off guard. No, no, no. I'm just, I can stop. No, no. Okay, no, no. no just to say anybody wants to write in and let us know what they've uh, enjoyed about this uh, uh, conversations with Tony. We'd, we'd love to hear from you because it's been a lot of fun. Uh, the few I've listened to and have been part of and Look forward to listening to them all. Uh, our email address is Modler's Life. That's Modler's the one L. Modler's Life at Gmail dot com. And I got we got a cool email today. We got uh, we got an email today from the guys at uh, the folks that are running the twenty twenty two convention. Nice. And uh, they want to want to know if they can come on the podcast and tell us all about it. And I went, absolutely, you can. That's the St. Louis Gateway Convention. The St. Louis Gateway Convention. They said, uh, is there, they were wondering if there's any opportunities that they would, we'd be able to offer them regarding uh, marketing in their convention. And we're going to put a, we're going to have those guys on here two or three times to get them, uh, help them as much as we can. So Brad Joseph, get ready, buddy. We're coming your way. Um. So, yeah. That's it. That's uh, about 12 hours of uh, podcasting with Tony, who has been extremely gracious and being available. Um, been tons of fun. Tons of fun. I, I mean, I think I, I, I think that was my favorite question, Dave, when I asked you, what would a 10-year-old Dave 
say to Tony Custer, and then uh, tonight when I realized, you know, I know what I would have said at ni- in nineteen in the early eighties, mid eighties, when uh, I was trying to figure out what I was doing. There was Tony all along. Well, and I, I, I and I think I actually kind of love the dichotomy of those two answers because, you know, not to get too deep into it, of course, but you're right. I mean, there's no one that's touched the hobby like this. Like, I mean, walking away, as you say, there's. There's people that have touched it in 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 a hundred different ways, and thank God for that because there's so much good energy in this hobby that's keeping it spinning. And when you look at what Otto's doing at Rare Model Craftsman, when you look at what the guys at Model Railroad are still trying to do and 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 create things with Trains.com, and when you look at Joe Fugate, I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of people trying to push things. And then there's the AML, which is reaching a whole new crowd at a whole new level. And with this this long term in depth interview, there's all these different pieces. But when you really look at, at at the whole thing, I think it's very difficult to say that anybody but Tony has touched it the way that that Tony has. And I think that has to that speaks volumes because I think the rest of us look up to that, you know, in a big way. And so I'll say it again, you know, as ten year old Dave, what can I do to be a part of it? Because that's all I would have wanted when I was ten years old was just to be a part of something this special. And it's it's a real privilege to be here. Yeah, and now here you are, and Tony. Is, you're just a, you're a friend of Tony's, and he's a ment and he's a mentor, and he's helped you get you writing that book and getting into the, you know, getting you in MRP. And I mean, he re, you know, he 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 recognizes talent when he sees. It. Well, it's 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 a real honor to to be someone that can test those waters and make mistakes and learn from the masters. I mean, let experts be experts. I think we can all agree that Tony is an expert. You know what you need. No. You need your own Patreon channel. You know, we've been talking about anyway, that. We, we got something special coming up. It's coming, buddy. It's I'm, ex- coming. I'm excited. It's cool. It's cool. I'm excited. I know. Um, And I got to put some of my creativity right into it. That's very exciting. Ooh. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. We got a, we got a website, amodelerslife.com. And if you go there, after you, you've you heard, uh, if you missed uh, the uh, email address. If, if you missed my bumbling effort at the email address, <laughs> this, this will make your day. Um, talking about radio voices, there's nobody does It's a Lincoln Homer better than you. Um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, so we have this website, amodelerslife.com. And if you missed the email address, if you just go onto the website, and very near the top, there's a picture of the moderately agitated male boy in a particularly agitated state. All you have to do is click on that photo and boom, you, you, your the uh, email will automatically pop up and you won't have, all you got to do is put in your text. And we love to get emails. Absolutely. We, we do. It's the, it's actually, I think it's my most fun thing to do is answer emails P- pro and con. Yes. We like them all. We like them all. If you don't, if there's something we do. Uh, that you don't like, uh, well, feel free to write in. I can't promise we'll uh, change anything, but feel free to write in. We like, uh, if you don't take criticism, you can't get better. I feel bad for Dalton, though, because I don't think I'll ever change about, I can't, Tony, uh, tell me this, uh, this is my, uh, this, is, is the, is the social media and the internet not made this hobby absolutely explode? Must have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a lot going on. I I pay very little attention to social media because it's too much noise to signal. Whoa, that's an interesting thought. Uh, Yeah, but I I see a lot of really, there's a lot of cool uh, Facebook pages. People's model railroads have some place to go and things like that. That's another whole discussion about model railroad, model railroad journalism and social media. Um, What else do we got? Oh, yeah. And if you want, Tony, if you ever want an AML t-shirt. Uh, Modeler's Life t-shirt, all you got to do is go to Midwest Model Railroad, and their URL is MidwestModelRR.com, and you go across the uh, navigation bar, and on the far right, it says AML. You click on that, and boom, you're in a wonderland, a wonderland of model ra- of a Modeler's Life l- uh, m- merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> Easy for you to say. Yeah, merchandise, and uh, hats, hoodies, mugs, Mug? t-shirts, whatever you could possibly need. That's it. I think we covered everything now, have we not? Uh, yeah, we've checked that, checked that. Yeah, we're good to go. And right, I think this is a, an episode, uh, so Tony, it's going to be the happy rails thing, uh, if you can handle that. You've, you've done very well so far, although I really liked you. I really like it when you're doing a six out of ten things, but this has got to be happy rails because uh, I'm putting these out as episodes except for part four 
ended up on the Patreon channel. Tony, if you ever feel like you're not getting enough of the AML and you'd like twice as much, just click on the uh, on the banner on the website that says Patreon. And for just 365 easy payments of 16 cents a day, you too can have twice as much AML in your life. Do you think he's do you think he's still here? I think he's stunned at the. Pro- the <laughs> I think he's. I think he's pondering. What a great deal! Yeah, I'm counting, yeah exactly. I'm counting the change in my pocket. <laughs> he's counting the change in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the guy did six parts. I think. I think there, there should be probably a T-shirt in the mail for this. Uh, Hold on, I, I think. I think. I think Sally Struthers is here. She wants to audition for the commercial. <laughs> yeah, there for you just go. sixteen cents a day. <laughs> You can you can help feed a desperate model railroader looking for more content. <laughs> hey, you know what, Dave? Yes, we, sir. Not only do we got to send him a modeler's life, uh, I think we got to go with the uh, golf shirt, the polo. Uh, he needs to get an OC one as well. Well, that's that's next on the agenda here, is it not? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, anyways, Tony, at the appropriate time, you have to say happy rails to you. Are you ready? I am ready. Well, Tony, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40. I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say, Happy Rails to you. Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motocorton Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumber Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer. <laughs>